Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branding Bud Live, the live stream that's 100% THC, 0% WTF. Every week, we bring business people to talk about the business of cannabis. I'm David Palaszczuk, the founder of Branding Bud Consulting Group and the author of Branding Bud, The Commercialization of Cannabis, the first book on cannabis branding. And I'm here with my best cannabis friend, BCF, Adriana Hemans, a marketing executive with eight years experience in compliance and marketing and research and has a vast knowledge of cannabis experience. So um, thank you, Adriana, for being my co-host and my BCF and joining us today. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you for being my best cannabis friend. <laughs> I feel like I haven't seen you in a million years. We have to change that. Well, it's only been a week, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long week, though. It's been a long week. That's true. You, you, This week, speaking of, of this week, it has been a long week. You drove from L.A. up to uh, Santa Rosa. You were at the Hall yeah. of Flowers, and then you covered almost all of California. So uh, That's right. It has been and a then week. in San Diego, I feel like I've been all over the world at this point. Yes. Just the world of California. Hey, Cheryl. Good to see you from Shasta County, California. Really? Um, Cheryl is uh, is jumping in right away, which I love that. And and just to encourage anyone else who may be listening who wants to participate, please do. We love to hear from you. Please drop your name and say where you are listening from and tell us a little bit about yourself. We love to hear uh, about our cannabis connections across the globe in some cases. That's right. We always have people from all around the world, and that's super cool. Um, and when they share and they ask questions and they participate, we love that because we're trying to build community here. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we have an amazing show today. I am super, super excited um, because I think there's some knowledge that can be learned and gleaned from this conversation we're about to have and apply to the cannabis space. So today we're going to be talking about um, cannabis and the customer experience. And our guest is Tom Stewart. Tom is the former editor of the Harvard Business Review. He was the chief marketing officer and chief knowledge officer at Booz. Tom has a vast knowledge of experience and uh, is now taking that experience and knowledge and applying it into the cannabis space. And we are super excited to talk with him today. A um, few questions we'll be, we'll be addressing is, uh, are, is the process of, uh, is there a process for designing a customer experience? And what are the key elements to a successful customer service strategy? And what role does technology play in enhancing the customer experience and how does that all get rolled up into the world that we live in which is the cannabis space so i'm super excited to chat with tom yeah me too i think this is going to be really helpful for anyone who is just looking for perspective on uh consumer behavior in general and and how to apply it to the cannabis industry which that's what we always love to do we like to call it the cannabis crossover uh what lessons can we learn from outside cannabis that we can use immediately to help us grow our industry so this is going to be a great topic right wow we've got a lot of people we have somebody from sunny seattle ryan anderson it's sunny here too i'm looking out the window it is sunny in seattle and aileen from san francisco and and reina from washington dc and marco who always joins us from taipei um and Morgan, mary and sam from vegas wow and cheryl from shasta county and uh, our guest is in new york we've we've got it pretty covered it's pretty good we're all over the place today i know well that said Let's bring out Tom and uh, and get cracking. Hey, Tom, welcome. Thank you. I, I was just thinking whether a best cannabis friend is sort of like a best buddy. <laughs> yeah. Best buds for life, man. Could be, could be. It's good to be here. Well, uh, we're excited to talk to you. Let's, let's jump in. Tom, What? Uh, tell us about yourself. What gets you up in the morning? Well, the literal answer to that question is two hungry cats, the clock radio, and a cup of coffee, uh, or three. Um, but you know, for many years, as, as as David was saying, I've worked at the Harvard Business Review, I've worked at Fortune, I've worked as the uh, executive director of the National Center for the Middle Market at Ohio State, and 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 I've always liked the sort of intersection between ideas and practice not only in the business world, but but elsewhere. I, I, I live and breathe ideas and I get excited when I get new ideas. And when I when I get a new idea, I'm like a, you know, a dog with a new toy or a teenage boy with a new girlfriend. I just, oh, 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 I just get thrilled by ideas. And so I guess that's what um, 
that's what gets me up in the morning. The idea of learning something new and playing with it and sharing it. That's very cool. And uh, and I can appreciate both the, uh, I guess, the conceptual side of things and the applied side of things as well. Um, so we're here to talk about cannabis and the customer experience. Um, why don't we all know what cannabis is, or hopefully we do. Um, and if not, I highly recommend it. Um, so so let's get to the to the customer experience um, component of it. You know, what is a customer experience um, really at its most basic? And would you give us an example of one? Yeah, let, let me, let me first of all, this is an idea, this is one of those ideas that I started getting excited about when I first realized that customer experience is a different and bigger idea than something like customer satisfaction or customer service. Customer experience is the whole gamut of things that happen to a customer that, and the interaction of a customer with something that she or he is buying. And then the, uh, let, me, let me give you a simple compare contrast example of it so you can sort of get a sense of the difference. You can think about, you can get a cup of coffee from Starbucks or you can get a co cup of coffee from Dunkin Donuts or you can get a cup of coffee from a lot of other places, but those two are very different experiences in every way. You know, At Starbucks, the line is long. There are many, 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 many choices. The lighting is low, there's comfortable seating, the logo is green, you know. Everything about Starbucks says, um, sit and stay, come and linger for a while. Everything about Duncan, whose tagline for a long time was America runs on Duncan, is get and go. I mean, the logo is pink and orange. Uh, the seating, if there is any, is uncomfortable in little stools. The lighting is bright. You know, and both of these companies, each of them selling what, you know, an overpriced, decent cup of coffee, are creating a different experience for the customer. And some of them are going to be appropriate in some circumstances, and some of them are, are, are going to be different. I mean, you know, I hate nothing more than being in a Starbucks line at an airport when I've got a flight to catch, because inevitably there's this long line and the person in front of me has been in the line for five minutes and comes to the front and says, and what do you want? And goes, uh, you know, on the other hand, if I have time to kill, it's wonderful. So that's what customer experience is. Customer experience is a designed set of interactions to, to designed to create in the customer a certain set of reactions so that she or he thinks, yeah, this is what I came for. This is what I'm getting. I like what I'm getting. Right. You know, and just to comment on that quickly, you know, having worked for MasterCard for, I don't know, 12 plus years, you know, I understood there was a, well, everything, everything is um, a, a purchase, right? But there's a transaction and then there's, there's um, a shopping experience. And those two things are really different. And, you know, what I realized coming into the cannabis space was that consumers are really different. And, and let me just run through, I use this example, it's total stereotypes, but I'll make it quick. You know, you have, um, let's just say a, a college kid um, or, or some young kid that wants to smoke a pre-roll during his um, half hour, 30 minute lunch. So when he walks in during lunch to take 10 or 15 minutes to, to buy a pre-roll and then smoke it during lunch before he goes back to work, um, he knows what he wants when he walks in the store. He's ready to buy what he wants and he wants to get to eating lunch, washing his hands and not smelling like cannabis before he goes back to work. Um, but if he gets stuck behind, again, stereotype soccer mom that gets up to the front of the line and looks at everything, including flour, um, beverages, sublingual slips, transdermal patches, vape pens, you, you, you know, you get it, edibles, um, run down the list and then she doesn't even know where to start if she's a newbie. Um, so that whole explanation of the different form factors and the different uptakes with each with each of the form factors is a big conversation. So it's exactly what you're pointing out, you know, and and then really how do you manage that across all your customers to make sure that each one with different needs has the right customer experience? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's critical. It, it, and, and it's also interesting. It's in, it's interesting because providers often are so focused on what they're selling that they pay a little less attention to what people are buying. 
I saw a wonderful survey, a wonderful study that was done by a major law firm. It was trying to work on its brand. And they asked current partners and former partners and employees, and they asked clients and former clients. They asked all kinds of people, what do you look for in a lawyer? And they came up with whole sets of different kinds of attributes, ranging from legal skill, technical skill, so on and so forth, to empathy and warmth and so on and so forth. And then they asked the lawyers what they thought was most important. And the lawyers focused on legal skill, technical ability, so on and so forth. And then they asked the clients and the clients focused on attentiveness, experience. They took for granted the idea that the lawyer knew the law. Yeah, it mattered. But what was a differentiator was the experience. And so it's interesting that the producer and the buyer had different ideas about what was most valuable. That's interesting. I'm sure that's really common in the cannabis space too. I'm sure we could think of some examples, right? Where people sort of assume that they know who their customer is and what they're looking for, but it turns out they're using their products for something completely different. Maybe something that they never even thought of, like for pain management, just as an example. Um, and they were thinking that it was like, they were going to a party and passing it around with their friends. So well, you never and, know. Yeah, and actually, David and I were on a were on a, a webinar with the LA County uh, people last week, where somebody in the chat said, "Ah, the only thing that matters is the quality of the of the quality of your stuff. The quality of the product is the only thing that matters." And we sort of jumped on him a little bit, I hope politely, and said, well, it's not the only thing that matters. Yes, it matters. But there are other things that matter too, including, David, to your example, whether I've got to wait 15 minutes behind, or let's be empathetic with the soccer mom, or whether I'm rushed through an experience. I mean, you know, she, she might come in there and say, and, and feel that that she was not getting the attention she needed to make a decision that she was not used to making. So, you know, you, you have these, these uh, product is important, but product is, is one element of experience and customers tend to be buying the whole experience and not just the product. Yep. And they'll go out of their way to go to a store, even if it's more expensive, that has the products they want and has the experience that they want, where they can ask questions or maybe the opposite where they yes. can get in and out quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. We have a couple quotes um, about customer experience that maybe we could take a look at that could give some context for our conversation here. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll read them out in case uh, in case anybody is watching on a small screen on a phone. Uh, the first one is from Steve Jobs. It says, you've got to start with the customer experience and work back toward the technology, not the other way around. Interesting quote. Um, and I'll read another one from Jeff Bezos. If there's one reason we have done better than our peers in the internet space over the last six years, it is because we have focused like a laser on customer experience. And that really does matter, I think, in any business. It certainly matters online where word of mouth is so very, very powerful. And then the last one here, um, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. That one, I think, is, is really interesting coming from um, having some experience working in, in market research and working with um, respondents who we paid them to tell us their opinion about products and services that they were using. Uh, they were a lot more verbose and a lot more detailed than people who had a good experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny, um, having, having worked almost eight years at Microsoft and that quote coming from Bill Gates, um, it, I kind of chuckle because uh, the thing I, when I read that is your most unhappy employees are your greatest source of learning. So that, that's true too. That's true too. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. The, the, the Bezos quote um, might come from the HBR interview that I did with him in which he pointed out that they, that Amazon has built its strategy on two ideas. One is good prices and the other is convenience, you know, speed of execution. He said, you know, the world of technology changes. The world changes really fast, but those ideas are are, are the, the hub of a the hub of a fast turning wheel. They stay, you know, they stay very steady and you can build a strategy around core ideas. And one of the things that was interesting, Amazon actually at one point experimented with competing with eBay in the auction business. And they stopped 
because it violated that experiential point of speed. The Amazon customer does not want to wait three days to see whether you know you've won the product that it, that it is. The Amazon customer wants it delivered in three hours, and so they said this is this is the wrong auctions are the wrong business for us because it violates the experience, which is a which is a pillar of our strategy. That's interesting. That's interesting. So um, so let's talk about that. I, I mean, when obviously there is a a there's strategy we're talking about for you know building a customer experience but you know can you help us or walk us through what it's like and what that process is and how does one design a customer experience how does one design a customer experience yeah good question i mean and it's a great question the first thing is to figure out what the experience is that you're trying to provide that as a as a as a fundamental principle. Now there, there are going to be exceptions to this. There's going to be soccer moms and there's going to be, you know, kids on their lunch break. But but you know, one of the first things that that I think is important is to understand the fundamental value that you want customers to experience. I think that there are nine experience design archetypes. And I know David, you have your brand archetypes and these experience archetypes actually can be mapped to some of the brand archetypes that you so smartly lay out in branding but you know one of them is is the the, the bargain it's you know this is it's the walmart of it's the cheapest place this is the you will always we will never be undersold that's one archetype another is the trendsetter the innovator we're the apple of we are going to be always on the cutting edge another is the safe choice it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's a Goldilocks kind. It's not too edgy. It's not too it's not too retro. It's you know take your in laws. It's Macy's. It's it's uh, uh, it, it's Olive Garden. It's you know it, it'll be okay. Um, another is the specialist. We only do X. We are you know we are the we are the orthopedist, not the neurosurgeon or the neurosurgeon. And the neurosurgeon, I can do your brain, but I can't do your right. I can't do your sinuses. Right. Um, another is the um, what we call the old shoe and that's the local it's like your pub it's like the restaurant where the meatloaf is bready and the coffee is weak but the waitress calls you hun and says would you like your usual and it's a very familiar kind of place <laughs> then there are solution providers and which you know i'm going to help you work your way what are you trying to do let me put the pieces together for you and then there's the aggregators which is like amazon's an aggregate it's one-stop shopping you're going to put the pieces together but we've got everything and you can think about that as like the hardware store where somebody can help you is the solution and the hardware store where somebody who really knows what he or she is doing comes and says i need this kind of nut, nut and this kind of screw they can be very very different so you start with that idea what are we trying to do and then you layer into that some questions about different customers and different types of customers these are often called use cases, and your two examples of the of of the the browser and the hunter are are two different use cases. And what do we what does a bargain want to provide for these for these two use cases? Whom do I want to attract, and what do I do to attract them? And you also then want to think about so you think about your basic archetype, what the value is that we think customers will perceive, not the value we think we've got, but the value customers will perceive. Think about how that would be translated by different types of customers, and then think about what they would expect. What would a, what would this kind of customer whom I want expect from me if I'm a trendsetter, or expect from me if I'm a bargain, or expect from me if I'm the old shoe, if I'm the local? With those things in mind, you can start to say what a great customer experience would look like. So that gives you your picture. You then People talk about a journey map. They talk about a customer journey, which is every time that the customer interacts with the seller from, you know, driving past the store or seeing them on the web to responding to an ad, some, uh, you know, walking, walking in for the first time, paying, you know, uh, service afterwards, every one of those touch points on the journey you want to map and you want to say, okay, what would the customer, these customers I want, what would they expect at each point? What would make them happy? What would make them hurt? And we like to call them the ah moments and the 
ow moments. What at each point, what do I want to do? And what do I want to not do to make sure that I'm delivering the experience you want? So that's sort of how you do it. And you can actually, as I've sort of been doing it with my hands here, you can imagine a whiteboard and lay out that lay out that journey. You laid out what your value proposition is, your archetypes are, thought about your expectations, and then think about the journeys that different customers would make and how you would make them happy at each point in the journey. That's sort of the process. Wow, that is totally fascinating. Um, I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, is there an element that's related to the customer service itself? So like, say you're a trendsetter provider, uh, are, is your customer service reps, are they going to be like a little bit aloof and, and there's a feeling of exclusivity <laughs> in the store? Just well, well sense. you know, think about, actually think about Apple and think about the difference between Apple care and, um, uh, and, and, and a lot of customers, a lot of tech support, you know, the Apple care support is actually gorgeous. And, you know, with the idea of the genius bar at Apple came from, uh, the concierge desk at the Four Seasons Hotel. And 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 that's a, it's an interesting example of something that's happening right here. One of the best ways to think about customer experience is not just to look at what's happening in your industry, but to look at analogies to other industries. And there's Steve Jobs, you know, start with the customer experience and work to the technology saying, I want customer support for Apple to be of the same kind of quality that you would get at the Four Seasons Hotel. Wow. You know, it, it's so interesting too, because, uh, you know, in, in the medical industry, they call it bedside manner, right? Uh, right. You know, it's like, yes, you expect your doctor to do everything right and to take care of you. And then on top of that, you know, um, it's expected that, um, uh, that, that, He'll, he'll listen to you and he'll or, or she she will you know focus on you and care about you and give you the the TLC that you know every patient well, think about Dr. House right right terrible bedside manner but technically brilliant um, and I would go to Dr. House if I knew I needed him but I wouldn't want to go to Dr. House as my GP <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny, um, you know, I'm noticing all these great people. Uh, Jason McHugh from Califari has joined us and Lara Fortas has joined us and Caleb. Hey Jason, hey Lara, hey Caleb, hey Maxwell, thanks for joining. And Jordan from New York City, hello Jordan. Jordan from Marino PR, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Well, so, uh, you know, I'm curious, we talk about all this stuff, but how do, um, how do, we, how do we measure this? You, you know, how do, how does one measure customer satisfaction? Well, there are a few ways of, you, of doing it. You can, there are some things that you can do that will measure um, customer loyalty, how, what, you know, and what, and, and the value of a customer. Does it, you know, does my, do I see the same customers over and over again? What percentage of my business comes from recurring customers, so on and so forth. So you can create, and the business literature will give you a number of, 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 uh, measures on that. There's the net promoter score, various customer satisfaction scores that can measure that. There's something else that I like to do and I think is really smart. I like to think about creating a report card that looks at two elements of customer experience. One is what the customer sees. Often when people think about customer experience, they think of what's on stage that the customer sees and what's backstage, what we need to do to produce what the customer sees. And if you, you can create a report card for elements on stage and backstage, uh, one of the things that we created in, in the book, Wu Wow and Win, my co-author and I, Patricia O'Connell, developed five measures for, for each one. Uh, they were empathy, I mean, the onstage measures were included empathy, um, Am I walking in the shoes of my customers? Expectations, have I set clear expectations? Emotions, have I figured, have I taken account the customer's emotion? You know, I'm at the side of the road with my car burning up and, and I call the insurance company and the guy says, please listen closely because our menu options have changed. That's not what I wanna hear, right? Um, elegance, is it clean and simple? Nothing, nothing superfluous, nothing left out. Um, and engagement, are there ways for me to interact? And there are five similar ones on the inside, the economics of it and you know, execution, quality of execution. And you can take those things and you can grade yourself. 
you can give yourself an ABCD, you know, grade yourself on a four, on a five point scale from zero to four. Zero is an F, four is an A, and then you can give yourself a GPA. You can add those things up and give yourself a GPA. You could do that also with your competitors, or you can do it with peers you want. Compare your GPA to that of the brew pub down the street, or compare your GPA to various others. And then you can sort of get an overall picture. And then you can also begin to identify things that you might want to improve and and improve both on the on the customer facing, the onstage stuff, and improve backstage. I think that kind of thing can something like a customer satisfaction score gives you a number, but it doesn't give you the things that go into making that number. And so I think you want both. You want something that gives you some sort of baseline economic number about customer loyalty, customer satisfaction, whatever it is. And then you want something that starts going in and seeing how the engine's working. Interesting. Really interesting and something that I think a lot of not only retailers in cannabis could benefit from, but also brands too. True. Um, things like, can they open the packaging? Is it too childproof? Is it, uh, does it have the information on the package that people are actually looking for or not? Um, we could dissect and maybe we should do that as a, as a follow-up episode is take some specific examples. We could get really, really in the weeds with that one, I think. Uh, it, it, you did it again. You get in the weed with that one, right? You get in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's terrible. I'm sorry. It's my one of my weaknesses. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, just to talk about this for a moment, this all begs. Well, so as we talk about the customer experience and we bring it over toward cannabis, um, this begs the question of vertical integration, right? Because let's talk about McDonald's for a moment. The the McDonald's experience, if you will, or a McDonald's experience is you're super hungry, you're driving down the highway, you see the golden arches from miles away. <clears throat> you know, it's like the North Star, it's getting closer, it's getting closer. You finally get off the exit, and of course, you have to figure out how to get there. But when you finally do, you know, you go through this whole experience, whether it's good or whether it's not good. That experience started when you saw the golden arches. Um, so for me, I think about vertical integration. I think about in, in states where they can, um, depending on whatever it is, but the spectrum being from seed to sale. So if somebody can grow it, pr produce it, process it, sell it in a store and sell their own brand in a store, then they can also brand the store, you know, obviously within reason and regulations that exist in each and every state where there is that. but you can start the experience sooner. Some cannabis, st some states with vertical integration would allow a cannabis company to start that experience sooner, meaning maybe when they saw the sign from afar, maybe when they pulled mm -hmm. the parking lot and saw the style of building. And when I'm talking about this, I, I know it's slightly different, but that's what McDonald's has done. That's what IHOP has done. Um, you know, they use architecture as, as a way of starting the experience long before somebody even gets into the, uh, to the building itself. So in cannabis, it's really interesting. Some states will allow this, some states won't. Mm -hmm. Some brands can have this advantage, other brands can't. And, and I just think it's interesting as we talk about what is that experience and where does yeah. it start? It's just important to bring this issue up, I think. I, well, today the architecture may start with the, I mean, the, the, it may start with the architecture, but it might also start with the app, right? That may be your first yes. introduction to a customer. There's some interesting things to think about in, in, in this because you may not be able to be vertically integrated, but you are part of an ecosystem. And, you know, you are you are part of the ecosystem of the, the mall where you're located or the street in which you're located, the neighborhood in which you're located. There's a physical ecosystem. There's an ecosystem in terms of your suppliers. Uh, you may not be able to be vertically integrated, but maybe you can be an authorized X seller or you can have a sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval. You can have a relationship with brands, you know. You worked at Microsoft. You remember all the Intel inside branding that Microsoft tried to do, or that Intel tried to do. Intel was selling not directly to consumers, but they had a prestigious brand, and so they wanted they wanted to attach their brand to what was there in the end product. So you can create sort of relationships there that are branding and 
and and and other relationships there's something here that is that that there's a there's a phrase that we use in the book that we picked up from somebody who was doing this at banking back in the 19 in at, back when Citibank was Citibank and not Citicorp and it was the idea of creating tangible evidence when you're selling a service as opposed to a product when you're or you're selling an experience as opposed to a product you can't kick the tires there's it's you know you can't you can't you know weigh the diamond and say how many carats it is you try to create tangible evidence and if you go way back into prehistory to the early days of McDonald's one of the things that McDonald's was trying to create was it was trying to create in a world of you know burger shops and clam shacks on the side of the road, they were trying to say, you can get a burger here and not get Tomain. And that was part of their value proposition. It was a safe place. And one of the pieces of tangible evidence is all the kids at McDonald's, all the staff at McDonald's, however pimply faced and adolescent they might have been, had these little white paper watch caps on and white uniforms. It was clean. And that cap was a piece of tangible evidence of the expectation that was related to the experience that McDonald's said it was going to provide to you rather than Joe's burgers and clams on the side of the road. It was a real important point. I love that. Fascinating. Tangible evidence. Uh, I want to follow a comment from Sam uh, Rodriguez, who says, Vegas is built on customer service. I always remind my teams of this. Everyone, no matter what, should be treated like they're a VIP. Uh, there's probably, in, in her example, some tangible evidence of what kind of service people will be receiving when they come to these establishments, and it's and it's communicated uh, clearly in, in the in the promotional uh, activities. So, really great example. Um, I wanted to quickly jump over since our audience has warmed up now, and thank you for your comment, Sam, to the audience participation where we ask folks who are listening in if they can guess the answer to our question. Uh, the first question, it is a multiple choice one. So uh, try your hand, you have a 25% chance, even if you're totally guessing, what percentage of store visitors don't know what they want when they walk into a cannabis dispensary? Is it A, 5%, B, 17%, C, 26%, or D, 48%? These are people walking into a cannabis dispensary, what percentage don't know what they want? Right. And that's interesting. Um, you, you know, and this this really begs the question here too, is like, depending on what that number is, you serve them totally different, right? If people know exactly what they want, you just serve it up to them as fast as you can. If people don't know what they want, they need to be coaxed into something or, or sold something or, you, you know, um, it, it's just a different experience. So. <laughs> Excuse me. So that said, we have some answers coming in. Um, yeah. Wow. Very we have two pretty. guesses for D, 48%. We have three guesses for C, 26%. I see one A in there from Brian, uh, the 5%. Mary's going to go with C. Jason's going with C. Aileen is going with D. That's sort of C and D are about equally split. Yep, it looks like... Yeah, it looks like it could go between C or D. Yeah. I think with, with dispensary shopping, it's sort of an interesting case too, because you might know what you want, but you might also be browsing and looking for something new, which that's something that happens really frequently um, around 420. We see sort of like crap, mm -hmm. sorry, cross category basket uh, happening more so than other parts of the year. Across more guesses for C coming in too. Cross category basket, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I will stumble over that one. But it's true. I, I think I fall into the category that you just mentioned, which is, um, uh, you know, when I do make purchases, it's uh, what's my old favorite? And then what can I um, experience and try, you know, something new? So um, there's always my old standby just in case, uh, you know, the new product isn't up to, up to snuff, but it's just interesting. Um, Tom, do you have any thoughts on this? You know, as I was thinking about this, uh, I was thinking, first of all, about the first time I ever walked into a cannabis store to buy legal cannabis. And, you know, the only question I'd been used to asking back in bright college days was, is this good stuff? And to be actually be offered a choice 
uh, poleaxed me. Oh, yeah, you know, like, and I said, well, I said, well, like, what do you mean? I said, well, do you want something to, for the morning? Do you want something to work? Do you want something to knock you out? Oh, and I began to start thinking about it. I'd never thought about the question. It reminded me of some stuff. Before I went into Fortune, I worked in the, in the book publishing business. And at the time when the big chains, Dalton and Walden, which are now been killed by Amazon, as they were emerging, we had an editor in chief who'd come from Dalton who told me that the number one consumer attitude walking into bookstores was terror, was fear, because most people didn't know what they wanted and were afraid that they would be embarrassed and shown up to be ignorant. So they were, you know, I want a book for my niece. Well, what does your niece like to read? I don't know. I don't, I've never met her. I don't know her. I want a book for my mother. What, what does she like to read? I don't know. Some people go in and say, I want the new Tom Clancy. They know exactly what they want. But a lot of people don't know what they want. And fear is a real, fear of embarrassment is a really important emotion that they feel if they don't know what they want. And one of the things those big chains did was they were designed to take that fear away by saying, here's the bestseller table. Here's the staff recommendations. Here's, they made, they, they sorted things out because there's a lot of choices in a bookstore into piles that made it easier for people to pretend to know that what they were doing, or at least to navigate their ignorance without being paralyzed and fearful of it. I feel like that's something that could work so well for for retailers in the cannabis space. Um, and we'll reveal the answer. It sounds almost like what you just mentioned, Tom, is that uh, there can be sort of a disconnect between people willing even to admit that they don't know what they want because of that fear and maybe because it's a little bit embarrassing, too. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and reveal the results of that, of the percentage of people who don't know what they want when they walk into a dispensary. And the answer is 48 percent this was a really interesting study by um by Bright one out of two right every other person comes in going uh right <laughs> and if you pick the wrong book in a bookstore chances are it will not have any major impact on your life but if you pick the wrong product in a dispensary you may end up passing out during thanksgiving dinner so <laughs> maybe even more fear or not depending on what your intention is right <laughs> that's right and conversely, if you pick the right book, that could change your life. So, so it's always, <laughs> always cool. Um, so, you know, Tom, would you just talk about the role of technology relative yeah. to to the, the experience? Yeah, there are two two things here to think about, and it's and it's a, it's a great question. Number one is that technology has means that we have more different touch points. So, in retail and other places, people talk about omni-channel, right? It's not just what happens when you walk into the store? It's what happens when you go to the website. It's, you know, you you engage with customers in all kinds of ways that are both interpersonal and technological for good and for ill, right? The good is that you may be able to get a certain consistency and quality through technology that you can't necessarily get depending on who you're dealing with. I mean, I like to say that you should design a business so that a great customer experience can be delivered by a guy with a hundred with an IQ of a hundred at ten o'clock on an average Wednesday, and it and it doesn't take you know that everybody can deliver excellent customer experience. You don't have to be heroic or special, but and technology can help you do that. So that's one thing. It creates omnichannel opportunities. It also creates uh, an opportunity to create certain sorts of consistency. Those opportunities are also difficulties, right? You can get you can get technology that is robotic. You can get the, please listen carefully because our menu options have changed. Uh, there is a wonderful study done at Arizona State University every few years called the Customer Rage Survey. And the most recent uh, edition of the, of the American Customer Rage Survey is out. And it will be probably surprise nobody that despite being mellowed out from cannabis, the amount of rage in the American customer is higher than ever. And it, the biggest, the biggest causes of that are I can't get a person. I can't yeah. find a person. I'm on the website. I can't get a person. So technology has can, can help you scale. It can help you automate. It can help you make things consistent, but it can also dehumanize. And insofar as experience is something that I create in my head as your customer, 
you don't want to dehumanize it too much unless that's part of the experience right part of the it's an automat you put in your you put in your you know, you put in your credit card you you know you get a you get a pre-roll like you can't do that yet but you know uh you but you could you can imagine something where the, the experience i want is hands off it's all automated it's it's schwab not not you know not a broker that you can talk to so you know those are the big issues omni channel what the experiences you want to create and whether you're creating dehumanization or using it to to improve quality that's really interesting how dehumanization can be part of the of the brand promise and the customer sure. experience you know, i hate to check like, out self-service at cvs i i yeah. hate to self-service check out at cvs some people love it they do too you know yeah I think we have only time for one more question, um, but I think what we were just talking about is so fascinating. I want to kind of, of dovetail on that and, and ask you, Tom, what are some uh, emerging trends and technologies that cannabis retailers should be aware of to stay ahead of the curve? Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff about machine learning and AI, and 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 it is really clear that chat GBT and the generative chat stuff is going to be able to revolutionize certain parts of technology. Um, uh, cust customer interaction. Um, I would re revert back, however, to the Steve Jobs quote, that you start with what you're trying to do and you start with what the customer wants, and then you think about what the technology solutions are going to be. Um, I've been doing some, uh, some work with the Alex Partners consulting firm, and they've done some very interesting studies about how um, machine learning, artificial intelligence and various other things can help can help break the trade off between proactive interaction with customers. Hi, David, how are you doing? Hi, Adrian, how are you doing? Uh, and scale it right? and, and, you know, and mass market, uh, because there is sort of a there is sort of a trade off. I'd love to give you personal attention, but I just can't give personal attention to 100,000 customers. Right. There are ways in which technology can break that trade off and make it more possible to interact on a personal basis, to get to know customers, uh, to have a you know a customer record right in front of you, so you walk in if you're there before. Oh, David, I see the last thing last time you were here, you bought X. How did you like it? That can be the kind of technology support that supports a human interaction, and the same kinds of things can happen if you're working on the web or something like that. It's so intriguing. Um, you, you know, you bring so many things for us to think about and and adriana and i always talk about um we we always talk about the cannabis bubble and we always talk about bursting that bubble and taking some of the best practices from the real world and and inserting them into the cannabis industry and you have um you know your experience is is bar none and and your ability to you know share those experiences is perfect and and we really need that in this industry. So, Tom, we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you know, some of the, the examples you've given um, and, and just some of the, uh, the history that you've shared with us about how other companies have done what they've done is really important because I, I just don't think um, that's an approach that uh, most people take in the cannabis industry. Um, so if we start thinking about our customers first, who they are, what they need, what those experiences are, and build backwards. Um, I, I think, uh, and take much of your advice uh, from today. I think we could build a better experience for cannabis consumers. Thank you both. This has been fun. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, as always, right? We, we've got we've got great people sharing great advice and great knowledge. That's really what it's all about. And next week is no exception. We have um, Sang Robertson, who is the technical director of cannabis research from Boston Beer Company. She'll be joining us to talk about the socialization of cannabis beverages, which is one of my favorite topics. Can't stop talking about cannabis beverages because I find it so fascinating. Uh, so definitely that will be a good one. Please click the link in the chat so that you can RSVP um, and we'll see you next week. That's right. And don't forget to check out cannabis's best kept secret at brandingbutt.com. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.